Good evening, and welcome to the MIT Hyperloop Pod Unveil event. My name is Philippe Kirschen, and I'm the team captain, and it's my great pleasure to invite you all here, or to welcome you all here this evening. Um, we have uh, a lot of people here. It's a really fantastic turnout. I want to thank you all for being here. We've got lots of sponsors. We have faculty. We have members of the MIT leadership, members of the media, and, and friends of the team. Um, and it means a lot to us that you're all here. So thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're really excited to show you what we've been working on for the past 11 months. So without further ado, let's get started. The Hyperloop, once a concept, now very much in development, uh, is a mode of transportation that has the potential to change how we think about travel. Uh, the, in its essence, the Hyperloop is a system of pods traveling through ex very low pressures at extremely high speed. The dream is a, mo a mode of transportation that is incredibly fast, incredibly convenient, and is conceivably carbon free. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware, or at least somewhat aware, of the, the white paper that SpaceX produced in, in the summer of 2013, kind of proposing or, or branding this idea of the Hyperloop. They weren't the first people to suggest uh, evacuated tube transport as a mode of transportation. But in releasing that paper, they generated a sort of excitement that hadn't really existed with the concept before. Um, and this, this excitement served as a catalyst. And so now there are multiple companies working on making the Hyperloop a real thing. Uh, one of those companies is actually one of our, our biggest sponsors, Hyperloop, well, formerly until Tuesday known as Hyperloop Tech, uh, and now Hyperloop One. Uh, if I didn't know any better, I would suggest they were trying to steal our thunder, but whatever. Um, so recognizing, SpaceX recognizing that they had uh, generated this kind of enthusiasm, decided they should hold a competition uh, to try and get more people involved and get more people excited about the, the project. So they announced this competition uh, back in June of last year. Um, and there are two phases of the competition. First phase is a design, week, a design phase that culminated a design weekend uh, in uh, Texas A&M University in January of this year. Uh, of the original 1,200 teams that entered the competition, 120 made it to College Station, Texas. Um, by the end of that weekend, there were 30 teams left, and we were, we were fortunate enough to be one of those teams. Uh, the second phase of the competition is a build phase. Uh, so SpaceX needs to, and that will be uh, culminating in a testing weekend uh, or a testing session competition sometime later this summer. Uh, SpaceX hasn't actually announced exactly when that's going to happen. But uh, our best guess as a team is that it's going to happen probably late August uh, at the earliest, around then. Uh, so they are, and one of the reasons that we don't know is because they are building this pod and uh, building this tube, sorry, for the competition. Uh, the tube you can see on the screen behind me uh, is a mile long tube. It's approximately six feet in diameter. Uh, it's a straight tube. And very importantly, it has this flat aluminum, uh, or I should say aluminum, Subtract uh, with an I beam in the middle. Uh, and they also are providing a pusher. So they, SpaceX's pusher is, is going to accelerate the pods in the competition, which meant that teams didn't have to work on a propulsion system for the pods. Um, but besides the, the pusher and the exact specifications of the tube, uh, SpaceX designed the competition to be as open ended as possible, um, which really allowed teams to, to set their own goals. So what were our goals? Well, we've had kind of a mantra on the team for the last 11 months um, that we want to make a pod that is safe, scalable, and feasible. I think the safe thing is, is fairly self-explanatory. Um, but the other two were really dominated by kind of one overarching objective and one overarching constraint. And our objective was to make something that we felt could contribute to the, to the advancement of Hyperloop, really be a scalable technology and could be used to, to improve the technology. Uh, that meant two things for our pod. We wanted to go really fast, and we wanted our pod to levitate. The constraint was that we had this really aggressive timeline in which to make the pod. So we, we knew we had to, or we set ourselves the restriction of having a pod that we could design and build by June of this year. Uh, and that really meant that we focused on the key technologies of the, of the Hyperloop concept, and we kept things as simple as possible whenever we could. So uh, next, I just want to give a brief overview of, of who we are as a team. 
We are 30 MIT students. Uh, we are a highly interdisciplinary team coming from a variety of different backgrounds. We have four undergraduate students, 10 master's students of science and engineering, 10 PhD students, and six MBA students. Between the 30 of us, we represent four of the courses here at MIT, uh, Aero Astro, Mechanical Engineering, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and the Sloan School of Business, uh, or Management, sorry. Um, we, I would also hazard a guess that we are the most internationally diverse team uh, in the competition, representing no fewer than 12 countries, as long as you count Texas as its own country. <laughs> Speaking of Texas, I would now like to uh, pass the stage over to our team's resident Texan, uh, our tireless project, leader, project manager, sorry, John Mayer. And John is going to give you kind of an overview of our year in review. Thanks a lot, Philippe. So now we're just going to have a little lighthearted slideshow here going through what we've gone through these past 11 months. And starting off, June 15th. This is a very important day because out of the blue, a lot of us grad students who had no idea that there would be this Hyperloop competition, we thought we would have free Saturdays, we thought we would just be focusing on our research, doing normal classes, all that stuff that I guess a grad student's supposed to do. But then the SpaceX came out with this little announcement here, and we're like, oh man, guys, we could really do a project that uh, not only is this like fun, but something that could change transportation, something that actually matters. So we're like, let's do this. We got a team together. Uh, starting off, we had a couple of months. SpaceX announced June 15th that the competition would happen later on. They would release the rules August 20th and just start getting your people together. And that's what we did. A group here in mechanical engineering formed and a group in uh, aerospace engineering. And we found each other eventually through our own recruiting emails to the respective departments, the opposite ones. And we're like, hey guys, we shouldn't do this separate. We should join. And then we came to be the team we are, about 20 people. Uh, and we were just brainstorming, what can we do? SpaceX didn't give us the rules on August 20th. September came around, they gave us a 10-page document. It didn't have specifications for what we were writing in. It just had some general overall rules. And so we just started designing based off the original concept. The original Hyperloop concept, as you all may know, has air bearings. It's like the air hockey table flipped upside down. And we're like, let's make a pod air bearings. Let's, we need compressor people. That's somehow how we did some of our recruiting there, was getting a lot of fluids people, getting a lot of compressor people. And then SpaceX gives us this tube spec on October 7th, and it has an aluminum subtract. And that is very critical because aluminum allows us to use magnetic levitation. So all suddenly all our fluids experts became magnet experts too. <laughs> and they did a good job at it this past year. But it's definitely been a learning curve there. This is our first concept we came up with. This was just getting our ideas thrown together. How is stuff going to fit? Uh, in the middle there, you can see we had some big friction brakes, some big suspension there, because we just like specced out some car suspension to get the fitment right. And uh, a mildly aerodynamic shell. But we have these magnetic levitation skis and these high-speed wheels on the end. So the overall uh, systems are in their respective places as they are now. But it has changed quite a bit since then to get the nuts and bolts and actual components to fit. More and more design reviews. Our advisors really helped us a lot by giving feedback. Uh, we just pushed through this. And by December 17th, we had this pod which could bolt together. This is the pod we took to Design Weekend. And Design Weekend is an event at Texas A&M University on January 29th and 30th where we presented this design to SpaceX. This was the design that we took there and we did pretty good with. It has, as you can note here, still hydraulic friction braking. It has magnetic levitation skis, the general suspension, high-speed wheels, a low-speed system was in the front. Some things on this have changed, so just if you can remember that drawing a little bit until you see our real pod, but the overall layout is still pretty much the same. So yeah, SpaceX Design Weekend was in January. We have this thing here at MIT, though, called IAP, and that's just independent activities period. There's no classes in the spring until February. So a lot of our team was very busy doing qualification exams, other projects, or just uh, not here at the moment, because they had planned other things over IAP before this competition was a thing. So we had a smaller crew here, but we got it together, and we went down to Texas. And what do you do when you go to Texas? Well, you got to go visit NASA. We're a bunch of nerds here, like <laughs> space shuttles. 
Got to go see that. And they just opened this exhibit the week before, so that was perfect timing on SpaceX's part. They totally planned this to be right up from Houston, I think. And then we have to also get down to business. So here you can see us at Design Weekend. There's 120, 130 other teams. MIT over here, shining bright. We have our booth uh, over there in the edge, so you can just see our backdrop there. We had screens going, and a lot of people liked us. There we had to give a 90-second video, too, as our presentation, which I'll play for you now. And just as optimistic and looking forward to there, a lot of people are interested in looking at us at competition, including Secretary of Transportation Anthony Fox here. And I think we did pretty good at Design Weekend, but maybe this video here the winning can team show you a little more. From the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT Hyperloop team. They're the team to beat after winning the design phase earlier this year at Texas A&M. <laughs> So needless to say, I think we did pretty good. And there's our team, all proud, very happy, a very emotional time there in Texas. After this, though, we realized, well, we knew before, but we're like, guys, now's the time we've been pushing off, and that's the time we actually have to build this and get this together in a, just less months than we designed it in. So moving on to that will be our chief engineer, Chris Marion. Thank you very much. Um, so as John said, this was the moment where we realized we actually had to build this thing, which was uh, pretty scary for a lot of us. But the, the first thing that we did was further expand our team up to the 30 people that it is now. Um, we knew that we had a lot more analysis to do, we had a lot more design to do, and we actually had to do a lot of manufacturing. So um, we expanded our team to what you see here today. Um, but a lot of that design work that we had to do, actually, we had not been originally planning to do because SpaceX uh, changed the rules right after Design Weekend. So one of the most important changes was the addition of the dummy. So this is a, um, this is a rendering of what it would look like if we had tried to put the originally proposed six-foot dummy into our pod. Uh, they did ask us to put it in a reasonable position. Um, <laughs> But we, we ended up deciding that uh, we should use a dummy that was much more appropriate for the scale of our pod, so it's actually significantly smaller than that. Furthermore, SpaceX discouraged us from using the friction braking mechanism that uh, Philippe mentioned, or, and John mentioned earlier. Um, they really didn't want anyone to damage their tube with trying to do friction braking at 200 miles an hour. Um, and so this was one of the most difficult meetings we had this semester, deciding to switch from friction brakes to magnetic eddy current brakes. Um, so that was a rather large design change for us this semester. Lastly, uh, the tube pressure uh, was raised almost an order of magnitude um, over design weekend. And so uh, that massively changed the flow regime we were in uh, for our aerodynamics. And so as a result, we had to completely rethink um, our aerodynamics. Um, and this actually, this is a video of the CFD analysis we did on the shell after, after we received this update showing uh, how, the, how the, air, the little air that's left in the tube flows over the pod. In addition to uh, the CFD analysis that we were doing, we also had to continue the magnet magnetic analysis we were doing. Uh, so not only did we want to further optimize our levitation systems, but we also had to completely design the magnetic array that would be used in the eddy current brakes from scratch. So we still had a lot of design work to do. But in addition to the design work, we also had to validate our, uh, validate our design. So this is our rotary magnetic test rig. Uh, that wheel spins fast enough to, to have tip speeds above 100 miles an hour, which is the range of speeds that we expect to see in the tube. And so the motion of that aluminum over the magnetic array that you see next to it uh, allowed us to actually validate the magnetic array that we were going to use in the pod. Uh, however, we, that test rig was not enough in and of itself. Um, because we can only test rather small arrays on that rig. So we built this as well, which is our linear, linear test rig. Uh, the cart that you see here on the left travels down uh, this, this track on the right, and we'll play a little video here. So this track is about 75 feet long. The cart right now is being pulled back against a rather long section of spear gun rubber, um, and it will be released and travel down this track uh, so that we can, again, measure the motion of the, measure the forces when you move magnets over this conductive aluminum. Uh, this was one of the, the more exciting projects that, that we got to do um, and actually turned out really well. We ended up validating our magnetic simulations, so the forces ended up about within 5% of what we had predicted, which was really rather impressive. 
We also wanted to test our electronics. So this is our communications and electronics test bed, uh, which allows us to test both how our onboard computers talk with each other, as well as how they talk with the various sensors that are onboard the pod. In addition to the design, we also, as we mentioned, had to actually start manufacturing this thing. So uh, in addition to the manufacturing we did in-house, we actually outsourced a significant portion of the parts on the pod. So here you can see actually the first parts that we got back. Uh, these are suspension linkage components. Uh, and here are some brake parts used in suspending the brake module. And this, uh, these are actually the parts of the brakes that hold the giant array of magnets that slows us down. We also, as I said, we were making electronics. So this is one of the printed circuit boards that we designed and had fabricated for us. Um, this is the brake interface module. So it's used to send the commands to the braking system when it actually needs to be actuated. And of course, we had to make the aerodynamic shell. So this is the mold for that. You can see it's machined out of layers of wood, which were then glued together and carefully sanded by our aerostructures team. Uh, after sanding, the, uh, the, shell, the mold gets coated in this, in this red coating for extra smoothness. Uh, and then we start putting the carbon fiber in it. So you can see, not only are we putting carbon fiber in here, but also we have these two other molds that we're working on over here that are auxiliary parts of the shell. After the carbon goes in, we put in uh, peel ply, then uh, perf film, and then uh, vacuum bag. So that's used then to draw vacuum down onto this, onto this mold um, so that we can do the resin infusion. So the, the vacuum pump pulls, the, pulls all of the air out from inside of the mold, and then we pump resin into the, into the mold on the carbon so that it infuses it. And you'll see it change color right here um, as it goes from that green to the carbon as the resin flows into it. So this was our wonderful little corner of the garage uh, six weeks ago. We had no parts in, uh, but we finally had a space that we could actually assemble the pod when, when parts started showing up. So this, uh, these are those suspension components I, was, I mentioned earlier as they actually came in and started getting assembled. And here you can see them actually being attached to the frame, and you can see we've actually started to get a lot of our parts in. These are the skis. Right after unboxing, we were inspecting them to, right before we assemble the back iron and magnetic components onto them. And then here is a fully assembled lateral control module inside of the pod. And while we have had many more hours of assembly since then uh, that have gotten us here, uh, and many more hours of design, many late nights, uh, and a lot of meetings that I think some people would rather have we not had to have. Um, we have a pod here six weeks from that, from that empty, empty garage picture. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to show you all what we have worked so hard on. So uh, as, as we talked about before, the, the outside of the pod is characterized by our aerodynamic shell, which was designed to have low drag in the, uh, in the tube environment that, uh, that we expect to see. Down here are the levitation skis. So this is where the magnetic array that actually uh, supports the pod weight while we're cruising uh, sits. Then uh, inside, underneath, in the front and the back are the lateral control modules, which also have magnets in them. Those actuate on the central I-beam to keep the pod aligned straight as we cruise. And then in the center down in here is the brakes, which actuate again magnetically on the flange of the I-beam to slow us down. Up top here inside you see we have the seat where the dummy goes. Here is the low speed system, which after the run is complete, clamps onto the rail and allows us to move slowly towards the end of the tube. Here are the hydraulics, which uh, provide the high pressure systems necessary to support the, the brakes underneath. And then here we have the electronics, which is where the power systems and brains of the, uh, of the pod are. In the back here, we have the, uh, what is SpaceX refers to as the PRI, the, the interface where um, the SpaceX launch vehicle will actually push us forward. And you can see they expect to push us forward uh, at upwards of two Gs, hopefully, to our speed, which will hopefully reach up to 250 miles an hour, 
where we will cruise down the majority of the tube and then break just before the end. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Aerostructures lead, Max, who will talk about his system. So as Aerostructures team, we're responsible for this beautiful aerodynamic shell and the, uh, the sturdy aluminum frame that keeps everything together. And these, these parts have turned into true pieces of art. And this is all due to my uh, amazing team members I'm fortunate enough to have on my team. So it is my pleasure to introduce Phil, Dan, Sarthik, Josh, Rich, and Rachel for all their hard work. <laughs> I also want to thank Josh and Corey for helping out with the shell. Um, so when you look at the shape, you might think, what is this? This doesn't look anything like, uh, like a high-speed train, like a bullet train or anything. And you would be correct. And that's because we're operating in completely different uh, operating conditions. We're at 100th of an atmosphere at 250 miles an hour. And under those conditions, a droplet-like shape is much more efficient. So it, it's quite blunt in the front and tapers towards the back. So this design changed a lot since design weekend. Uh, it's much more aerodynamic and uh, also has room for, uh, for a small dummy now. Another thing that changed is that the whole shell is now uh, a carbon fiber sandwich structure. And this keeps it incredibly light and uh, still very stiff such that we can operate at different, uh, at higher two pressures if we need to. And we also have another uh, shell right over there with uh, which is bare carbon, so you can see, look at that later. And these shells are not uh, the structural backbone of the frame, in, uh, of the pod. Instead, we use an aluminum ladder frame to keep all the components together. And in this design, we really focused on driving down uh, design risk and manufacturing risk. So we really focused on uh, timeline viable manuf uh, manufacturing. And that is actually a reason we're able to present this pod to you today a few months before our actual, before our competition. Another thing is that uh, with this aluminum frame, it gives us the flexibility we need uh, if components need to change during testing. And with that, I would like to hand it over to the uh, sub-team that keeps my sub-team afloat. Here's Greg Monahan from the levitation team. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the levitation team consists of myself, uh, Derek, Philippe, and Nick. Uh, and so the levitation team was tasked with the, the development of a system that would basically allow us to uh, travel down a tube very quickly with no contact with the track uh, and to try and generate as little drag as possible. So um, something that would be good for the competition itself and also something that we wanted to be scalable for kind of the full size uh, Hyperloop idea. Uh, and so one of the things in the competition that SpaceX tried to do is leave it uh, as open as possible so that a number of different types of systems could be tried and tested. Uh, and so one of the things we did when we first started uh, was look at a number of different options for us to try. Uh, so that included air bearings, a, no a number of different types of maglev systems, uh, as well as even a uh, wheeled option. Uh, ultimately, through the constraints of the competition, the rules, and a lot of our own analysis, uh, we decided to go with an EDS maglev system. Uh, and so, just for a little bit of background, EDS maglev system is electrodynamic suspension, uh, and it basically operates by having an array of permanent magnets uh, with relative motion over a conductive plate. So in this case, it's the aluminum track uh, at the competition. Uh, as you get that relative motion, you induce currents in the plate, uh, which creates its own magnetic field, and it kind of repels off. Uh, but you don't get that lift for free, so something that comes with this is magnetic drag. Uh, and so the vast majority of our analysis and simulation uh, has been to try and vary a lot of the array parameters and, and try and optimize for uh, the highest lift to drag ratio that we could get. Um, one of the other things that we were responsible for in the levitation team was all of the simulation and analysis uh, for the other magnetic systems on the pod. So that includes the lateral control that kind of keeps the pod centered, uh, as well as the brakes to slow down. Um, and so to try and validate these different simulations and, and analysis that we did, uh, you saw a number of the, the testing that we did earlier. So both of the rotary test rig and our linear test rig uh, to try out each of the different systems and, and make sure we could um, kind of optimize our lift to drag. Um, we were really satisfied with, uh, with the comparison between our simulation and our testing, and we're really looking forward to trying to test out the whole pod and all the systems together. 
Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Charlie with the Vehicle Dynamics. All right, good evening, everyone. So my name is Charlie, and I'm team lead for Vehicle Dynamics here on MIT Hyperloop. Uh, before we get into the details of what that means, I just want to recognize and thank my awesome teammates. They've you know, put in hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work to make this possible over the last couple of months. Uh, definitely would not be here without them. So first, Peter, Abe, Sean, Raghav, Sabrina, and myself. Now, over the last couple of months, we've been responsible for designing four different subsystems on the pod. Uh, the first of these is our primary suspension. So you can see these springs uh, supporting each of the skis. Uh, the primary suspension is basically designed to keep the pod under control. Now, although we're going to be levitating magnetically, that doesn't mean the pod isn't going to experience disturbances. And basically, the function of these uh, springs and dampers is to control all of those disturbances so that the pod is safe and stable during the whole run. Sort of alongside that are these uh, wheels that you see on the front and back of the pod. These are not intended for high speed, but just for takeoff and landing uh, between when we're actually levitating. So our second subsystem that we worked on was the lateral control modules. Now, there's one lateral control module on each side of the pod. And basically, these are responsible for handling the sideways motions of the pod, keeping us, keeping us under control in that direction. Now, similar to our lift magnets on the skis, these have magnets, except they're oriented 90 degrees uh, to the side. And they interface with the I-beam, which is going down the track. And what that means is we have non-contact control of the vehicle. Uh, and that's backed by a mechanical spring and damping system that the magnets are mounted on which means we can quickly optimize and adjust the system uh, during, during our test runs and make sure that everything is behaving as we want it to. Now, the third subsystem we've designed, uh, obviously, is the brakes. And I would like to remind you again that as of 15 weeks ago, we presented a completely different brake design. So, uh, and then I think two weeks after that, SpaceX changed the rules. So we've not only completely reanalyzed, uh, designed, built, and assembled all these new brakes, uh, but I also you know, just want to thank everyone who worked on that. Raghav was our lead on brakes. So obviously, it's been a crazy couple of months uh, doing that. Uh, now, once again, we're using magnets for our brakes, uh, except this array has about 500 permanent magnets uh, arranged in a very drag-optimized fashion. So whereas with our skis, we want the most lift possible, the brakes are looking for the least lift and the most drag, um, which lets us stop as quickly as possible with the smallest uh, possible module. And one key feature of these brakes is that they're uh, mechanically fail-safe, which means if we have electrical failure, power failure, uh, issues with our sensors, the brakes are spring-loaded and they'll close shut, uh, bringing the pod to a safe and controlled stop if anything ever goes wrong. And finally, the fourth system that we worked on was our low-speed system. Now, Chris mentioned this earlier, but basically, the low-speed system is really important because it means our pod can independently move down the tube, which means before and after our run, uh, we can move forward and backwards. We can enter, exit the tube uh, totally on our own. We don't need any help from a pusher vehicle or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, a lot going on with vehicle dynamics. Uh, and with that, I want to hand it over to Colm, our electronics lead. Yeah, hi, everyone. So I'm the uh, lead for the electronics on the team. And uh, I'm joined with Laksha, Stephanie, and Io. And they put in just a tremendous amount of work um, over the past school year to get this ready for the competition and for tonight. So the electronics on board can really be subdivided into three categories. The power system, the sensing system, and the communication system. The power system consists of the batteries, motor controllers, and relays. And these supply power to our various actuators on board, but also to our sensors and our control units. During flight, we levitate passively, so we don't need very much power just to supply the sensors and the control units. So that means we can get away with um, relatively small batteries in terms of energy capacity, but most importantly, in terms of size and in terms of mass. For higher power components, uh, such as the actuator used during braking, we have a separate 36-fold system. We have over 30 sensors uh, on board our pod uh, measuring everything from how high we're levitating, keeping an eye on how far we've traversed down the tube, but also monitoring things like battery temperature. And acquiring data from these sensors, that's the function of our individual uh, sensing and control units, which make up our communication system. These control units speak the various languages of the sensors, but they can also share that information with each other. We have the hardware in place for to do that. And um, this communication infrastructure is the backbone for the software. 
um, which we'll talk about next. So I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Azat, who's the team lead for the software. Howdy. Thanks so much to Calm. We, so you could tell that we are the software team. I want to introduce, we have Scott. We have a third member of the software team uh, who is, I think he's running a marathon, so we couldn't make it. <laughs> but I want to thank Electrical. We work very, very close with Electrical, of course. Um, so software has simultaneously a really big and what looks like a really small job. Um, you could tell from all the, all the, the talk from, from Levitation, from Vehicle Dynamics, that a lot of the degrees of freedom on this pod are passively actuated, which is awesome for us because that means we don't have to write the software to do it. However, there's one really important decision that we do have to make, which is when do we stop? And that is the entire, like, that everything in software is built around making that decision better and making it safer. Uh, so a lot of the things that software really has to think about is fusing information from all 34, 36 sensors that Calm talked about to tell the state of the pod, to tell where we are, uh, to tell whether it's safe to break, whether we need to start emergency braking. Uh, we also need to, just in general, be, uh, uh, we're also, the brakes themselves are also a really interesting system. I don't want to go too far on a tangent about them, but they have really interesting and weird dynamics, which for, uh, we both come from robotics backgrounds, which gives us a really interesting just notion of even just thinking about how to control these brakes is really hard and really cool. Um, so we're writing a lot of software to, to have to do that. Um, and then everything we design has to be extremely robust and extremely safe. Because if you think about the speeds that we're going at, our uh, window of opportunity for hitting the brakes, to hit the final spot we need to hit, we have a window that's less than a second long. And if we miss it, uh, we'll splat. <laughs> so the, uh, the computers that are pulling this, this all off, Calm started talking about them. Um, on the very the lowest level, we have five uh, embedded uh, microcontrollers that do a lot of the data wrangling, they talk to the sensors, and they also do a lot of the real-time control. These are all managed by a single, it's actually an Odroid, it's a quad-core Linux, uh, embedded Linux computer uh, that does the higher level logic, uh, the network communication, and I guess all the higher level control on the pod itself. And then it talks wirelessly to the rest of our system. We have an interface that, you know, it's actually shown in the back. Whatever, you know, if you, if you can run, if you can run PyOpenGL, you can probably run our interface. So you just talk to it. So the interface and everything else is part of an enormous tool chain that we've been building. Um, a lot of it actually in-house. Uh, to support this entire system. Uh, and we've really been focusing on making sure, the real theme of, our, of our, all of our software tools is making sure that every part of the pod can talk to every other part of the pod and we know how to test it all together in one big system. So what's going on in a video that's not playing, it would be playing, uh, it's gonna be live over there, so just go look at it, um, is actually a display of, we can run the entire software stack, everything that would be running on the pod, all in simulation, all in one computer, uh, to test out the entire system in one big pile and just see that it all works together. And this actually, this actually goes further than just making sure it all works together. This allows us to demonstrate uh, and develop and debug whole system-wide behaviors, figuring out how we want to do state estimation on the entire system, how we ensure things are safe, how we make sure the user interface actually works and that when we're trying to fly the pod, it's not a nightmare. Ah, perfect, here we are. Uh, so I'm gonna cut myself off from talking too long. I can talk about software forever. Um, but thank you guys so much. We are so excited to fly this pod. This is gonna be so cool. Uh, so back to Chris. So I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit now about what's next. Um, well, obviously we have, we have built our pod. We are far from done. Uh, we have a lot more testing, a lot more debugging to do. Um, and we, we really are looking forward to going to do that sort of stuff. We're currently waiting uh, to some degree on SpaceX to get the track built uh, as well as their, their test facilities, um, but we are hoping to get to do that uh, at some point this summer, and as we mentioned earlier, hopefully competition will be late summer, early fall, and we'll get a chance to go fly this thing. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to our business team leads, Georgiana and Nargis. So please give them a warm hand. Hi everyone, I'm Georgiana and this is Nargis and we have the honor of leading the business team uh, which is made up of first years and second year MBA students from Sloan and they are Josh, Alex, Nick and Chuan and Chuan was actually the original business team lead. So as the business team, our goals are really twofold, 
So first, um, we really work to tell the story of the MIT Hyperloop team, and that's through our websites, through our social channels, as well as through events like this. Um, and then on the second, um, on the other hand, we work with organizations and companies that are here today that are helping us fund this great project. Um, today, I would like to take the opportunity to thank some of our media partners. Um, you have really helped us share some of the most critical milestones in this journey to making the Hyperloop pod a reality. It's been a pleasure working with you, and thank you to those of you that are here today. Thank you, Georgiana. Um, and I wanted to say that as we unveiled our pod today, it's a huge pleasure to be surrounded by the company of such committed sponsors and Hyperloop enthusiasts. We wanted to show our appreciation today for your generous contributions, for your patience, for your support to our challenges, successes, victories, for your friends, for, for you, for those of you who are friends and family and had to deal with um, things and um, situations when everything wasn't going fantastic <laughs> for us as people. And we wanted to, to say thank you to all of you today here, but especially those of you who have joined the team um, as our supporters early on we were, when we were just a team of a bunch of MIT students with a big dream. Your support gave us so much more confidence and encouragement to pursue our dreams, our goals, our vision. And thank you so much for being here and making this Friday the 13th a very happy and special day for us. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to give it to John. And it wasn't just support outside of MIT that helped us build this. We had a lot of great support here. A lot of MIT helped us. ISMT got us some good computers to do our analysis. And especially Edgerton, they gave us a good garage space. Uh, Sandy has been dealing with so much procurement. With all these sponsors we brought in, we also brought in a lot of spending to buy all this stuff and had to get that all processed, which has been fun. Pat and the shop has really helped us get this all together. because. We didn't know this was happening a year ago, so we didn't have a space here, and space in MIT is very valuable. So getting all that together, getting multiple other organizations to, like Beaverworks, to help us have a room there to meet, and just all around MIT, there's been great support. And finally, our advisors, Maria, John, Doug, uh, Woody, Bob, and of course, Noel, who have advised us, who's gave us presentation tips, pod tips, just like, oh, you might not want to do that. Set it all our design reviews, listen to our hours of rambling on about this pod, and even uh, came down a competition week is, weekend with us. So uh, they, they've been very great, and they also have their graduate students, they have their classes, and they still took this on, and we are very grateful for that. <laughs>